really pleased to see a good turnout again. Um, our whole goal is to have some interesting conversations with people working in, in the space that I think we're all working in. We're entrepreneurs, we're working in music and entertainment, we're working in technology, and um, we're all interested in kind of pushing things forward and creating new solutions and cross-pollinating a little bit. So that's why I'm pretty excited about tonight's guest speaker. But thanks again for coming. Um, I'm going to hand it over to John. All right. <laughs> and step away from the camera. Great. Guys, thanks for coming tonight. This, this is going to be a, a good discussion tonight. I'm just I'm thankful for yeah. Brian for being a good sport and jumping in on this. Um, just again, kind of tying into uh, Katie's thoughts about Innovation Group Nashville. It, it, this is a monthly conversation we have, first Thursday of each month. Uh, we'll be here at the Entrepreneur Center and uh, really kind of at the intersection of three areas, uh, entertainment industry, technology, and entrepreneurship. Uh, even though, and, and the whole idea is, is to share best practices from other companies that are further down the road uh, more mature with companies that are following behind that. So one of the the things we talk about um, in, is that uh, is the idea of one company's hindsight is the next company's foresight. So Brian has been generous to to come and talk to us and have a conversation and uh, share kind of his experiences um, with the next batch of companies coming behind it. So even though it's in a different vertical, Brian's in the financial services space, so many of the things we've talked about in the past have been, have correlated directly what we're doing in one of our companies. So uh, with that, uh, Brian Fox from Capital Confirmation. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Good. So Brian, give us a little, t tell us about Capital Confirmation, tell us about kind of your experiences and kind of your backstory. Yeah, I'll give you the backstory. Um, essentially my background, I'm from Nashville, grew up here, went to college in Dallas. Uh, everybody said take more accounting classes. And when I asked people in business, what, what, what would they have done differently? And uh, so I did that because I didn't really like accounting. I took it first to try and get it out of the way, like eat the peas before I could enjoy the rest of the meal. And I uh, realized I had more of an accounting degree, uh, closer than a finance degree in terms of getting a, a major. So I did that. Ended up at that point said, well, what do you do with this accounting degree? I said, go work for a big six firm, great experience. And so I went to work for Ernst & Young out of SMU in Dallas. And while there, saw the transition from paperwork files to electronic work files. And the first year, I was told everybody I was happy to staple, copy, fax, go get a box of tick marks, whatever they wanted me to go do as, a, as an auditor. As long as I was getting a paycheck, my grandmother told me to be happy about it and uh, just work harder than the guy next to you. So that's what I did the first year. Uh, the second year, I was, uh, we were there in the Dallas office. We were one of the pilot offices for their electronic work paper solution. And so we transitioned that year as a pilot office. We got to play with the new technology that Ian White had created. And it was, it was great. I moved on to my, my largest client that year. I was a staff too, ready to actually learn a little bit this next year instead of just summing up numbers and uh, seeing if they ticked and tied. And uh, unfortunately, we lost our intern to another job. Uh, we lost our staff one to another job. And even though I was a staff two, I was a little man on the totem pole. And uh, the senior <coughs> came in and said, Tag, you're it. You get to do all the grunt work again this year. And uh, I wasn't real happy, but I was a lot more efficient the second year, uh, which is what I shared with him in my review when he asked why I wasn't so happy. Um, but part of that was the confirmation process. And simply, it's a very simple process in a way. Uh, when any company is getting audited, HCA, for example, here in town, the Entrepreneurship Center that goes through an audit, uh, the auditors come in, the company will say, I've got $1,000 on the books or $10,000 on the books with this bank or I'm owed this much money uh, from this company. And as auditors, we can't just trust documentation in a client's hands. What we do is we send out what's called a confirmation letter. So we mail a letter to the bank, maybe AM South to verify $10,000 on account there or a CD that they have or a lot of credit or we'll send out a confirmation to a, a, one of their customers to say, do you really own $1,000? Hopefully, all those folks write back and uh, all the numbers match. Paper-based It's all paper-based. And so, it's very inefficient. I recognize there was a lot of fraud in this or potential for fraud because we didn't really know who was responding on the other side. 
and uh, went to PwC, really had the same frustrations, inefficient, a lot of paper, and uh, was done, I thought, with auditing. Uh, came back here to go to business school and uh, said at some point somebody's going to fix that paper process and wrote the business plan in business school here. Turns out to be you. It, it did, yeah. It's just pure frustration more than anything else. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of how I got, got kicked off with the idea of creating essentially a network. Um, so it's very similar to any network, whether it's eBay or any other. There's one side that needs information or has something and the other side that needs to provide it. And um, so we, toll sit, we sit in the middle of the toll booth. Yeah. Right. So that's that's the background of the story in terms of how we got started. So, so the idea in the kernel came out of your time at Ernst & Young? Yeah. Okay. So what, what was that early ideation phase of, hey, here's a problem, I'm frustrated, to green light, I'm going to do this thing? Yeah, for me it was um, my, my professor over at, at Owen, it was Jermaine Baird, you know, probably most of you guys know. Um, and he said, he fortunately had an accounting background, he said, you know, this is a pretty good idea, you ought to run with it. And so at that point I started raising family and friends money, uh, passing a business plan around Nashville, trying to see who might have an interest in either helping me grow the business or investing in the business. And, and the environment uh, at the time, I started this in between my first and second year, was a lot different than it is today for entrepreneurs in Nashville. Um, this was the summer of 2000, I founded the company in June of 2000. And at that time I was 26. Um, at that time, it was still cool to be a 26-year-old CEO of a technology business. In fact, everybody said if you weren't under the age of 30, you had no idea what was going on in technology and the internet. And <laughs> by the time I graduated a year later, the internet bubble had burst. And you know, here I was coming out of business school, having raised some family and friends money, uh, but the internet bubble burst. And so we hit the ground running to, to raise some money after business school. And with all things, life happens. So all the entrepreneurs in here, you will realize you know, life happens at the same time you're trying to grow your business. So I was married. My wife was in graduate school at the same time I was graduating together. We had a daughter uh, who was born the first week uh, before school started. Our, found out our, our second child was due uh, the week of graduation. So here I come right out of business school with uh, essentially two children uh, under the age of three with an internet business when the internet wasn't so hot. And we hit the ground running, and it was funny enough, I just found the uh, presentation we made to a local group in Nashville. You found a lot of folks who want to be, uh, they'll invest if somebody else does. You know, you'll find a whole lot of those. Uh, but finding that lead investor is key. But we found a group that said, we'll be your lead investor. And we said, great. They said, come present to our board. We did. Uh, believe it or not, that was on uh, September 7th. Mm -hmm. uh, they voted, or they went to vote that night. They had more on their plate than they thought they could handle. They didn't get to vote, so they said, go home. We'll call you tomorrow. Uh, they called us tomorrow and said, we didn't get to vote, again, too much on the plate, we're going to vote at next week's meeting. So my partner flew back up to Connecticut uh, on, the, on the 8th. So Chris was on board. Chris was on board, and then at that point, a couple days later, 9-11 happened and the financial markets died. And uh, we were pre-revenue, hadn't even built a platform yet. And so here I was, uh, you know, I'd already spent a lot of my family and friends, roommates, aunts, uncles, cousins, money. And uh, I would say that that time was tougher than it is today. To raise money, or certainly not now, but the last couple of years. Uh, that, that's tough. <laughs> I don't know. Because because at that point, every company out there, if you, if you weren't cash flow positive, you were dying. Right. Because there wasn't a VC firm, there wasn't any angel investing take that took place for at least two years. They just let companies die because they didn't know where the, the financial markets were going. Right. Um, so that was a pretty tough time that we came through. So we came through that. We've come through the last couple of years. So uh, it's been interesting. Yeah, that's great, Brian. So how did you talk a little bit about customer one? How did you get, you know, you built, you built a prototype. Mm -hmm. Had you built a prototype <coughs> at this point? Or? No, at that point what we did was really right after 9-11, um, there was four of us that moved into my grandmother's garage apartment. Uh, she let us essentially work out of there for four? two years. Four of us. Wow. Uh, no salaries. Uh, everybody, we were working on us, deferring student loans, putting it on credit cards personally. Uh, so this is literally the garage? Literally my grandmother's garage apartment. Uh, it was kind of a one bedroom. Dave Malone would work upstairs, the other three of us would work downstairs. Um, okay, so talk about how you structured the four guys in a garage. Pre-revenue, mm -hmm. you convinced a core group. Three others to stick it out. <laughs> well, they, to nobody was hiring either, so that was kind of my okay. benefit. 
is that nobody was hiring, so at least this was an opportunity. I was paying people. So what stopped. was that conversation like? Saying? Well, one of them was was pretty funny. It, it, at the time, it was it was uh, Chris and, and Jeanette and I, and Dave Malone had been giving me a call. Chris had ran Visa Act Interactive. Right, he had run Visa Interactive. So he was not a MBA recent graduate. No, not a recent. He he had the wisdom and experience, and we can talk about it, kind of how he he joined us. Yeah. Uh, but but you had to be creative as, as all entrepreneurs do. And so Dave came and said, hey, I you know, was looking to sell in the financial services, understanding, you know, you guys have a financial services company. You know, are you looking for a spot? We said, we'd love to hire you, but we don't have any cash. So Dave is? He, he runs today our banking sales. Okay. And so, um, so what we said was, look, if you'll invest in the business, we'll have enough money to pay you back. Um, you can get some equity that way, and we'll have enough money. So essentially, he paid tax on his own money twice because he got taxed the first time he earned it, and then he got taxed the second time he earned it. Um, but they, but we were doing this kind of thing. He believed, he believed in the vision. He believed in the team. He did, and so we had you know, the, one of the biggest things that we had going for us is we were hitting milestones all along the way. So that was giving anybody that maybe was keeping us afloat uh, some confidence, as well as the you know, the four of us. To stick it out and uh, to do that, so we were paying each other essentially in, in stock where we had to, or yeah, everybody was eating their own expenses, right. and uh, we just kind of believed in the vision at that point. Yeah, that's great. So the chicken and the egg question: Hey, I've got this killer solution for mm -hmm. your problem. How do you populate, or, or what did that? What was that experience like of, of getting? Yeah, for us, it was it was probably more challenging than most types of businesses, and, and we had some investors who either invested in us or, or looked to consider investing in us, and they always said, we like your business, it, it'd be great if, if people actually sign up, but the challenge you guys got is, is it's a network model. It, you can't just sell one thing to one person, you have to sell both sides, and, and then they've got to have an overlapping need. It's kind of like if eBay had gone out and you had a car, but I was looking for a chair, We're not, they're not going to have a lot of revenue. Um, so you could post your car for sale and I could go look for a chair, but they're not going to get any, any transaction volume. We've got to have accounting firms on one hand, banks on the other, and they've got to have a mutual client that both sides need to either provide or, or get information on. And so literally, uh, first customers were all personal relationships. Um, Pinnacle Bank had just started out at the time. and Friends and family. Friends and family, family. yeah. I went to see uh, Rob McCabe. Um, he was having a meeting in Brentwood. I met him in the, in the lobby. He actually thought I was looking for a job, and uh, I was like, no, no, I'm not looking for a job, I'm going to use my service. And so uh, it was just personal relationships. He, I told him what we were trying to do, that we needed a favor, and he said, sure. Um, and then turned to an accounting firm here in town, Bob Wisnett's firm, Granison Wisnett, said the same thing, and that was our first accounting firm and our first bank that signed up. And so at that point, we were in Nashville, we had one bank, one accounting firm. Um, we were able to show that the service worked, and from there we added couple more banks in Nashville, then those kind of took us to Tennessee, then Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, and we were getting some banks and accounting firms on both sides of the transactions as customers pulled us into new markets. And um, so that grew to the southeast, to the U.S., and then last year we had users in over 155 com countries uh, who accessed our site. Bank of America. Yeah, we've got today all 10 of the top 10 banks in the U.S. The Federal Reserve rolled us out oh, last year. Uh, we've got over 8,000 accounting firms. Um, and so the growth has been cool. We were number 96 on the Inc. 500 last year. Um, and to do that in a, in a, in a really tough two-year market, uh, we felt pretty good. We had no idea what we were going to come out of that. We submitted the application, and they sent us the box. We all opened it. We were going to be upset if we weren't at least in the top 500. Uh, we got to be in the 500. Yeah, well, that was the thing. We didn't get it. So uh, then when we made the top 100, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that is amazing. So, so, so your company... From, from the garage, grandma's garage, is now, has now had a 10x return for your investors. Well, we hope so. There hasn't been a return yet. We haven't uh, haven't had a... The valuation uh, is... It, it's been pretty good. You know, um, we, we've been fortunate in terms of when we raise money. All, all together, we've raised about $11 million okay. uh, in financing for the business. Um, we did really the first family and friends round. Um, which was kind of spread over a long period of time, as anybody would write us a check. Um, that was about six hundred thousand uh, dollars. That got us through that two-year period, uh, two and a half-year period. One lump sum that 
pieces. No, that was little pieces. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was times when I told my wife on a Friday, I said, look, if we don't get some money, I've got to pay the American Express bill on Monday. I've got to send a check in, and we've got to pay health insurance. Because that we did pay health insurance the whole time. And that was one of the things I said, we're going to pay health insurance. Nobody asked for about their health. Yeah. And um, I said, we're going to have to sell the car on Monday. And she was like, fine, we're going to be a one, one car family. we got two kids, and we adopted a 13-year-old that summer, actually, when we got started. So Kara was 26 with two children under the age of three, under the age of three and a 13-year-old, and uh, no income. And my wife kept saying, go get a real job. Don't you know what your business <laughs> are making? Go back to Ernst & Young. It's safe there. Yeah. And um, so we, we had some people, and, and fortunately, like that Monday, we had somebody send us a check. So I didn't have to sell the car. I'd already gone to CarMax. I'd washed it. We'd gone. Oh. We got the quote. And it was only going to cover one month of expenses. Right. And um, she was like, well, it's only one month. It's just stupid and crazy. Right. And I was like, but it gives us 30 days. And this, how long have you been working on the company at this point? Um, at the CarMax point. Yeah, that's, it, it was probably, we were probably two years into it yeah. at that point. Yeah. Um, 600000 some came after that, okay. so that was probably in the middle of that, yeah. right around in there. Okay. So, uh, and then we did a, a 1.1 uh, debt round, which is what got us out of, um, after 9-11 when the markets finally opened up, we did it in the form of debt. And, and then a debt a, round, right. explain kind of what? We did, we, it was essentially a $750,000 loan from investors with warrants attached, um, so that they had first rights on all the assets in the business, and it was really the safer investment than some sort of an equity which well, means they have the option to well in ours buy they, stock at the yeah they actually had both value. yeah they actually had it was penny warrants so they we had to, to give them their money back plus interest and they got essentially the, the option to buy penny warrants or penny shares of stock at a later date at a later date gotcha. um, and so then we did a four hundred thousand dollar bridge loan as we were raising our next round so really it was a one point one million dollar loan and then we closed a three million dollar preferred A and then a five million dollar preferred B. Okay. Uh, and those are the rounds that we've gone through. So kind of friends and family, angel round. And the next two were yeah, even that we've we've never had to do the institutional round. And I think a lot of people will tell you that, that startup businesses these days don't ever have to do an institutional round if, if you don't want to. Um, okay, and, explain explain why is the distinctives around institutional. Yeah, the institution would really be just the VC round. Um, that, that, that typical, right, that, that standard, what everybody used to know is, is venture capital rounds. Um, the angel investors, the, the communities, the, the, the opportunity to raise capital from high net worth folks or um, quasi-institutional, meaning their family funds, those kind of things, those exist and the, the benefit is for us, the terms are going to be better, um, they're not going to be nearly as aggressive uh, in terms of uh, both what they're looking for uh, from the institutional investors. And um, sometimes they're, they're not as friendly to the business either. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to steer clear of that as much as we could and, and have been fortunate to essentially skip over that round. Any IP patents at this point? We do. We've got um, two patents. I mean, as they are, at, not now, but. Wally yeah. Patterson, our attorneys. Yeah, um, a couple of the guys are. Yeah, Ed has been helping us out. But, but at that, at that we, yeah, early, early, early on what we did was we filed for a provisional patent application and then filed for the full application I think in, in about um, 2002, okay. and that first patent, because it was a business process patent, took about six or seven years to get. Okay. So it was a long process to go through. Um, the backlog, I think, now is even longer. Uh, but then we filed the second patent application in 2004 and just got notification of that acceptance a couple months ago. Um, so it was a long process. So, so <coughs> why is that part, why is that valuable to capital confirmation, the, those patents, what does that allow, what does that mean to the value of the company? For, for us, what I've always told folks is, in our business, for capital confirmation, we've always told every investor, it's, it's not a fail-safe, it doesn't mean that we've got the golden egg, it means that for us, if, it's a, if it serves as a six-month speed bump to somebody, then it's done its job. Because if, if we can slow somebody down from entering the market, then that's at least going to give us six months extra leeway to a year to react to whatever it is they're bringing into the marketplace. And so we've always said, with technology and, and business processes, people can do things a hundred different ways. Um, and so, again, if we can slow somebody down, that's where we saw the, the value of it. Okay. Good, good. If it keeps somebody out of the market, great, but if it 
if it can serve as just uh, slowing them down, that's, that's perfect too. Yeah. And also add value. It does. It, it helps in terms of, of right, in exactly. terms of, of really the barriers to entry. Yeah. It begins to, to make that a little stronger. Good. So at, at this point, what kind of advisory board did you have in place and, and um, how did really, that come together? Yeah, our, our group really has been the board. And I brought in a, a partner, Chris Shellhorn, early on, um, and he's really been my mentor. Um, I actually brought him in as the chairman and CEO of the business, um, and so and that's we, a big deal. Yeah, so you're different. the founder. Yeah, and you and had, the largest shareholder. You had the foresight to say, "Hey, look, I may not be the best guy." Yeah, and, and I absolutely, I absolutely wasn't. Um, I mean, I had the idea, I had the wow. the, the energy. Talk about that. What, 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 um, that's for, for me, what happened was it was it was it was somewhat obvious in that um, we had been introduced to some some large customers, Bank of America being one of them. They'd sent us uh, they liked the idea, thought it was interesting, but they sent us their due diligence package, and this was when we didn't have any money. And it said, "What do you do?" Which is what I thought they were going to ask. And then it said, after the internet bubble burst, they changed all their, you know, their due diligence. They said, "What's the management team's experience? Um, what are your backgrounds? What do your financials look like? What's your technology security?" Um, along with what do you do? And I couldn't answer anything other than what I was hoping to do because we didn't have a product at the time. And so that was a pretty big due diligence list and I took that to my board, my advisors, my attorneys, my accountants and said, look, in order for me to give a return to my family and friends who invested in this business, um, I've got to build a business that can answer these questions to where they're going to buy. Because in a network model, especially like ours, whoever owns the top 10 banks and top 10 accounting firms was going to own the market. Right. And, I, and I had to do that in order to win. And so my law firm, Austin and Bird, that was doing our corporate work out of Atlanta, um, had also been Chris's attorney when he ran Visa Interactive, which was uh, Visa, their wholly owned stuff that did everything that Visa did online worldwide. Uh, Chris was the CEO of that business. Visa sold that early on to a company called Integrion, uh, which he started off as the chief operating officer, became the CEO of. And that was the first online banking platform. Um, it was a consortium. Funny enough, you guys all laugh. The big banks, when the internet uh, was started, they said, we don't know if this whole internet thing's going to work and it doesn't make sense for us to go build our own banking platform. Let's have a shared utility. So they all pooled their resources, $3 million a piece, the largest 18 banks. Visa came in as the payment processor, which was, they just took Visa Interactive and put it into Integrion, and then IBM came in as the technology provider. So it was 20 owners. Um, Chris became the CEO of that business, and it was the first online banking platform for the largest 18 banks. Um, but the, what happened was once the internet took off, the bank said, we don't really like sharing our marketing strategy online with each other. Let's separate. He rolled the technology back to each bank for them to run individually and was consulting. And that's when Austin and Bird and, uh, said, well, you ought to talk to Chris. He's kind of consulting in this area. OK. So your legal general counsel made the introduction they did. to Chris. They did. How did you convince Chris that he needed to step down from the CEO <laughs> of Visa Interactive? Well, no, he you know, he he had, he had left Visa. Part of this little uh, yeah, he had left Visa and, and Integrion, okay. and so that had been rolled back, and so he was just doing consulting okay. for companies at the time. And uh, he'll always tell you that when we when I gave him the idea, he said, "Well, it's a neat idea, but I've raised money in several prior businesses, and I'm not into that anymore." And so he always jokingly says, and we've raised money for about the last eight years together. Um, I think he felt sorry for me. Really? <laughs> yeah, here I was. A kid from Tennessee he called from his yeah. grandmother's garage. You know, I think yeah, he liked the idea. I think you know, from a personality standpoint, we just hit it off real okay. well. And, um, you know, I, I had the accounting side and kind of the enthusiasm. And he came with the banking side and the wisdom. Yeah. And so the marriage of those two really created a pretty neat opportunity for both of us. So you didn't have to drive the bus. You birthed the bus. Yeah, that's, yeah, and, and really though, what's cool with any entrepreneurial business is, you know, whether it's four people or you know, when we finally got to 10 people, or we're, only, we're still small today, we're about 26 people. Um, we've grown a little bit from the 10, but when you're 10 people, everybody sits, sits around the table together and solves the yeah. problem. So, um, yeah, that's the cool part of being in a in an entrepreneurial business. They didn't ask me my opinion when I was at Ernst & Young. They said, add that column up. Uh, I got to do a lot of a lot more stuff sitting around the table. Mm -hmm. So, 
Just a board of directors, no advisory board? No, not really. I mean, we, we've kind of used people as advisors, but, but never formalized an advisory board. Um, again, part of Chris's wisdom is, is he said two things related to both the board and advisory board. He, you don't want more board members than you've got employees, which we would have had. And, and he said formalizing an advisory board then also just creates work because you have to have some form to do. And we had enough stuff to do with four, four people. And when we were 10, we still had enough stuff to do. We're, we barely have enough capacity for the board questions today. And we've only got uh, three outside board members. Um, so that was, and I'd say early on when we had no money and some folks said, well, I'll buy a board seat. Um, I, I'll invest if you'll give me a board seat. It was really hard for me to turn that down. In fact, we debated it. And Chris said, look, if somebody wants to invest in the business, make that decision. They should make that separately than um, serving yeah, then, then serving as an official board member because that, that gives them governing power. Sure. And if you don't know them real well, you don't know who you're getting into business with, and, and that can be real messy. So selling a board seat. This, you're right. Separating the investment yeah. side of it. And we, we, we had some folks who decided not to invest because they couldn't buy a board seat. And, you know, that was interesting when yeah. they had no money. So that's great. Hmm. So, um, Talk a little bit about metrics within your company. What do you measure? Is that an important part of the conversation there, or is it just up and running and well oiled and you don't really have to? Honestly, we, we wish we had two MBAs that could sit and analyze the data and, and provide us with metrics and, and information on the business and, and those key performance indicators. But we really don't have the, the staff to, to do that and don't plan to hire them. Um, you know, we do have the things that we measure, things like transaction volume. Um, it's probably for us that we've got somebody that sends that out every morning. You know, what's, what's, what is it each month? What is it each day? And we track it. Um, so the transaction volume from us is, for us as a transactional business yeah. is really the key metric. And then we certainly track uh, number of banks, number of accounting firms, number of users uh, yeah. in each of those groups. Mm -hmm. So what does what does and cash flow? We always keep track of that. <laughs> Where are we in cash in the bank? By your grandma. <coughs> yeah, cash um, is king. What exit strategy? Is, is that part of the conversation at this point? Or is, or is this the company that you want to run and be part of for the next 20, 30 years? Yeah, good question. You know, it really all depends, right? I mean, if somebody were to come along and you, know, you had studio now and they got a great offer from, from some folks and they said, well, you, you stupid not to turn that down. 30, so 36 million. Is yeah, so, million. so not, you, know, you, ne you never say never to something like that um, when the multiple on revenue was well over 30 times revenue. That's a pretty good multiple. And studio now. Yeah. Um, that was pretty good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think where we stand is the last time we raised capital, which was in 2006, we said we're going to use this capital to get to cash flow positive. And We've stayed focused with one product, which is bank confirmations in the United States. We've had a lot of opportunities to do other things. We've got a lot of people outside of the U.S. that use us. But we said in 2006, we're going to be focused. We're going to get to cash flow positive. We've raised enough money. We've taken enough dilution. We don't ever want to have to raise capital again if we don't have to. If we raise capital ever again, we want it to be our choice. And fortunately, staying focused on our core product was what really got us to cash flow positive in the last three years. because. I had a lot of friends with businesses who spread themselves too thin, they needed capital, and in 2008, 2007, we're out in the market raising money early 2009, and valuations were half of what they had previously raised capital on. And so we didn't have to raise any capital, and we felt like we are in a good spot. Now, we're, we're looking, we just had a board meeting, and we've, <clears throat> then shareholders meeting, we've always said, we'll look around. Um, so is it, do we grow with our own capital? Um, we've got a lot of phone calls recently for private equity firms because there's a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines and when you have some publicity um, like the 500, they want to invest in fast growth businesses. So there's that opportunity. We've got today 130 shareholders. Uh, so you've got a handful that are always looking for some kind of a liquidity event. Um, so there's the opportunity to do a recapitalization. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of, of options. The one that's probably not on the table ever is, is an IPO. I don't think any company these days will everyone put themselves through that unless they have to. Um, but for most most early stage businesses like like those in the room here, um, 
Most companies will never see the IPO market as an attractive market again. Share, you mentioned some of the shareholder meetings. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, you know, is, that, is that a quarterly? No, the, we do it annual. It's an annual okay. um, shareholder meeting, and that's just really to give everybody an update on the state of the business and, and where we are. Um, the, the, the objectives we had the prior year, where we are on those objectives. Uh, and do you update them during the year outside of that? You know, we shareholders meeting. We used to, and it's an interesting story. We we used to do Tell quarterly us. updates, and we were sending out quarterly updates, keeping everybody uh, updated on how the business was doing. And we've always said we'd sit down with any investor and, and talk to them about how the business is going. But we thought you know, we'll send out quarterly updates. Well, one day, Jeanette and Chris and I are in Jeanette's office, and she says something about Chris asked a question. She said, "Well, you can find that on the internet. You can find anything with Google." And Chris said, why? Really? She goes, oh yeah, let me show you. She put in Chris's cell phone number. And a whole bunch of results came up. And he's like, wow. And, and then he looked down and about, the, we looked at about the second or third one on there. It said something about capital confirmation. And Chris said, well, click on that. So we clicked on it and opened up to one of those free PowerPoint share open to the universe things. And there was our shareholder investor update really? with our financials and, mm -hmm. and margins and all sorts of fun things. And uh, that's the last investor update we sent out. <laughs> um, we called the website. We said that's that's proprietary, confidential so it's information. It's really out of confidentiality. It's yeah, like you don't, we don't send out PDFs. If they want to know, they can pick up the phone, call us. We'll meet with them, have lunch. They come to the office. They can come to the shareholders meeting. But we're not required to send out quarterly updates. And unfortunately, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Very good. So that is a great answer. <laughs> Time will answer. So. Um, Probably not an IPO. No. But you're open to acquisition offers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've had we've had a couple of offers in the past. Yeah. Um, and when we were raising capital, um, we had had one last year, and you know we we look at it, we see where the you know, what the opportunity looks like. I think when we were raising money, um, one of the ones came in and they said, look, we'll, we'll the acquisition price was essentially what the free money valuation price was. And we said, well, we've got enough good things going on that we think you know, we're going we're gonna to continue to go forward. Um, and so we kind of rolled the dice and said, we're going to bet on ourselves here. Um, because we, were, we knew the things that we had in the pipeline that were going to create more value than selling at that point. So raising the capital was going to allow us to bring in those contracts or new customers. And they weren't giving us credit for those because they, they weren't in-house yet. Right. Um, and then you know, the market started to heat up again. Certainly, from either private equity or you know uh, financial investors or, or strategic buyers, uh, and so you know we suspect at some point somebody will probably reach out again, and you know we'll entertain and, and see what what that looks like if the the market timing's right, uh, the valuations are right, and the good news is we've got the ability to say no, thank you. Yeah. Good, good. So, as an entrepreneur, Brian, what what is a non-negotiable for you, like for your, say your next company, what would be the, the absolute core thing that you would, would die on the bed on? Um, team, concept, product, I mean what? Yeah, I mean certainly it's, it's the team. Um, the folks that, you know, kind of your core group of folks are, are gonna be who you live and die with. Yeah. Um, and you gotta be able to trust them and everybody's gotta wear a lot of hats. And so the, the team, and I understand now why and the investors want to see and understand and meet the team. Because there's a lot of great ideas out there. I mean, you guys hear a lot of them that come in here. And at the end of the day, it's the team. Um, it's, the, it's the group that they're investing in as to whether or not there's a confidence level that you can actually execute and uh, build that business. And, you know, I think we've been fortunate to, to be able to have done that. Mm -hmm. So what is the thing that you would never do again that you learned <laughs> that is seared into your psyche? Lots. Um, investigate your partners. We ha had uh, had a couple of employees who uh, stole money from us early on, and that was very damaging to the business. Uh, I mean, it almost took us under because uh, we didn't have the capital to lose, and um, so you know we had to had to separate ourselves from them and, and move a different direction. And uh, you know, as a small business, Four we cause yeah, action. absolutely. Um, but as a small business, it wasn't like we didn't have, we only had six or so people at the time, seven people probably. 
And uh, I mean, that was a large percentage of our workforce, but it was also people you trusted. Right, right. And that was one of the most hurtful things, is that um, you know, these were people you trusted, you relied on, and then you find out that, that they're not honest brokers. And uh, yeah, it's disappointing. Yeah. So you know, kind of learned some of those lessons the hard way. So know your team. No, as much as you can. Going into the yeah. 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 Good, good. So advice to entrepreneurs, people in the room here and just in general, what kind of blind spots do you do you see in most entrepreneurs that you can say, hey, learn from what are the blind spots you see most entrepreneurs have that they um, don't know they have? That's a great question. Yeah, it, it kind of varies uh, a little bit um, because entrepreneurial DNA is, is different. It's a little like Charlie it's, Sheen. It's different DNA. It's like, <laughs> was it Tiger's blood? Yeah, yeah. a little crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, entrepreneurs are, yeah, are different. You guys all know that. Um, certainly, taking risks uh, are things that you have to be comfortable with uh, when you're an entrepreneur um, and, and get out there and work hard. Uh, and, and for me, it was always being able to equate my work to the reward uh, versus just moving up a corporate ladder uh, based on how long you've been there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, certainly from an entrepreneur standpoint, seeking out advice, you're going to get folks who share a lot of different ideas and then it's trying to figure out what's the right piece of advice for you. Okay. Um, so listen from, to your advisors. Yeah. But not blindly listen Correct. to Correct. Um, Probably the biggest thing that was helpful to me was networking. Um, getting out there, just meeting everybody and anybody, because you never know who's going to have a connection to somebody. I mean, that you may say, well, I'm meeting with this guy. He's got no reason to really be talking to me. But you're telling him, well, I'm, I'm selling it. Yeah, I've got this service I'm selling to banks and accounting firms. And he goes, oh, well, my, my brother-in-law happens to run a bank. You know, and he was completely in a non-related industry. And so just sharing your story with folks here, with anybody you meet. Face to face. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be key because they will, they'll give you those introductions. Um, so that's all. Face to face meetings were vital. Um, I mean, that's one of the, the things that we lived on was uh, we said meet somebody at least once. It's harder to say no uh, if they've met you. And so we'd make these phone calls where we were driving all over the place. I mean, the only plane we ever used was Southwest. And so you can see the accounting firms and banks we got because of where Southwest flew or how far we could drive. And, you know, I remember we, we'd be talking to somebody like in Jackson, Mississippi, and um, they'd be like, yeah, I, we'd say, well, can we, you know, how about a meeting, you know, sometime this week? Like, well, how about if you call me tomorrow at 3? And I'd be like, interesting enough, I'm going to be in Jackson tomorrow. Um, not too far away, I can come by. And uh, I'd get in the car, drive six hours, have a 3 o'clock meeting for an hour, and then drive back for six hours just to be face-to-face -face with them. Uh, and literally did those kinds. Um, just to be that be that face to face meeting, and they'd be like, "No, no reason. Just send us something over email. We can talk on the phone." I said, "No, no, it's no problem. We'll be there." Um, and so, so we face to face, absolutely email, Skype. At least that first time, okay. At least that first meeting, yeah. Um, and then certainly um, cash. Cash flow is going to be vital um, for everybody. Yeah. Good. Well, hey guys, we wanted to uh, leave a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, yeah. Hi. Um, introduce I, yourself. And, uh, uh, my name is David Gales, uh, and I'm a consulting firm here in town called the Gales Network. Uh, we do brand management. Um, I'm curious about two things. Number one, I tend to put entrepreneurs in two large buckets, and some are, some are in both buckets. I find there are builders, people who like to build something, and there are people that like to grow something. It sounds like uh, the event where you had Chris join you mm -hmm. was sort of the handoff between the building and the growing. Are, do, you, do you consider yourself a builder or a grower or both? Um, I'd probably say both. Um, I, I think I love the, the idea phase and, and brainstorming on the ideas, solving problems, um, those kind of things. Um, you know, we're, we're at an interesting stage as a business right now, uh, which I think a lot of companies find themselves in eventually, and that is how far do you build it on your own. Um, you know, today, 
we've done, we've built a good business. Um, but one of the things that we do face is that, that next round of hires probably won't be people that will necessarily add and be accretive to the bottom line. They'll just detract from it. Um, I mean, we don't have a CFO today. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of sales folks. In fact, we've got two. Um, so we don't have anybody in Europe selling. And so we're trying today to leverage partnerships to reach those markets um, without trying to build. Um, and so to some degree, not that I'm anti-build, but we want to, we've been intentional about trying not to build too fast and outpace our, our growth to where, um, where we're trying to hire people and that's really the job is us hiring people versus growing the business mm -hmm. because you can spend a lot of time training people and having turnover and we've been very fortunate with almost no to very low turnover. Um, so we'll kind of bend over backwards for the employees. So that's why you're keeping that, that 25-ish number at this point in it, it is. It has been. And, and one of the things we want to do right now, uh, one of our goals as a business, is to show operational leverage, to show that we can grow the business without growing headcount. Um, and I think if we can demonstrate that, that puts us in a pretty interesting place a year from now. To keep the team small and the user base. Right, and show how we can take, you know, grow the top line revenue, take the majority of that to the bottom line, and therefore show that in order to grow the business, we don't have to grow so you're trying to revenue the headcount. Even if a, a body is not responsible for revenue specifically that on a per body basis, you've got everybody's Correct. generating a reasonable amount of revenue. Right. Um, the other question I had is on a completely other level, and that's it strikes me that the nature of your business suggests that there's an extraordinary amount of liability um, because if you if if you accept the communication from one place and offer right. it to another place. And that communication is fraud or false. Correct. And I'm just curious how you deal with that. Yeah, it strikes to me be a huge. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's really what I saw when I was performing confirmations. I said, you know, I remember uh, controlling the process is key, is what the standards say. And I remember standing over a fax machine waiting on a fax from whom I thought was Wells Fargo. And they said, look, if you leave, go to the restroom and somebody go get a cup of coffee and somebody's assistant at the company gets it off the fax machine, you've lost control, you gotta re get Wells to refax it back to you. So control for confirmation process is key. We've got our own authentication authorization procedures where we validate both sides. And that was where I said, look, as a staff auditor, it doesn't make sense for every auditor at Ernst & Young, much less every auditor at every firm, to go out and validate Bank of America or SunTrust Bank every year for every client. If we can do it once well and let all the accounting firms leverage that, that validation process, then they'll pay us for that. And so not only do we have the efficiency opportunity, but we had the fraud reduction uh, yeah. with our service. And so we, we have ours who come in and review our authentication procedures. Um, but I'll tell you, when we first started off, nobody even cared about fraud. Um, they said, we're not worried about fraud. We trust our clients. We're in PTA together and you know, we're all in church. And, and wow. uh, yeah, in, in orders, kind of, I've always told them when I teach courses, I said, well, you, we were always taught not to take clients that would commit fraud. And so by that means, I'm going to submit to you that you think none of your clients would commit fraud, otherwise you wouldn't have taken them as client. So you're walking into the audit with, with the wrong mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I tried anyway, nobody listened. So I said, fine, we'll sell efficiency for a couple of years. And, and we began to do that, um, launched the service commercially in the summer of 2003. And selling efficiency, getting some firms on. I talked to the big firms at the time, and they were said thanks, interesting. And then December 23rd of 2003, uh, kind of a, our first game changer was Parmalat, the Italian dairy company, issued a press release uh, on their website that said, "Sorry, we lied. That 4.9 billion dollar bank account, uh, Bank of America, doesn't exist and never has." And 96 percent of the stockholder equity went down the next day. We were on the cover of the New York Times business section on the 26th of December. Didn't even know it until we got a phone call um, about it. I would send out kind of a press release that said, you know, hey, we've got a service that looks at this. They put us on the cover of the New York Times business section. And two weeks into January, two of the big four firms, or two of the big five, I think at that time, or four, uh, called us and said, hey, can you come up to New York and tell us a little bit more about your service? Because Grant Thornton got sued for $10 billion, and Deloitte got sued for $10 billion as the auditor of the parent company. And the whole thing would have cost about twenty dollars in our service. How, how did you uh, establish pricing? Um, 
really, we at first I went out and I surveyed some folks and said, what would you buy it for if this was available? Um, and then we, we went out and it really kind of tested the market in a lot of different ways. So early on it was more trial and error. So we would have a couple clients and we'd say, well, would you pay this? And we did some subscription models. We did some, uh, you know, pay for annually for all you can eat kind of thing. Um, we were, where we ended up was a transactional model because it seemed to work well for firms of all sizes. And that is the firms pay us based on a per account, per bank account model. So what happens is the smaller firm, if, I'm a, if, if John and I are two partners and that's our firm, well, our clients are probably going to be smaller. They'll have a few number of, of accounts. So it'll be a, a very low dollar amount for the overall cost of the audit. The bigger clients will have thousands of accounts. It'll still be nominal in the overall cost of their audit fee. Um, but it would be based really on the size of the client in a way based on the number of accounts they have. And so that's how we've done the model, is a, a transactional per account model. No subscription? No. Annual. No. Right. We've got some annual fees for some, some services that we provide to some of the firms, uh, some customization type things. But really, 95% of our revenue is all recurring transactional. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I was, cur cur I was curious if you don't have a CFO. Is that because you have a county background? <laughs> you know, I, I don't like accounting, actually. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I did it just because, I a CPA, just because I, I thought that, that would give, I've always said accounting is the foreign language of business. Um, if you don't understand your numbers, you're going to have to rely on an interpreter. And I, that wasn't very comforting to me. And so that was why I wanted to become a CPA and, and really understand my own numbers, because I knew I wanted to, to be an entrepreneur. Um, but. We don't have CFO. We have a controller. She's great. Oh, okay. um, you do have. We do. And, yeah, but she's she's part time. Uh, we've just tried to really limit the, the staff that you know we've got. Yeah. Uh, and you know, as a small business, we just didn't have that need to for a high powered CFO at the moment. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so I think the point of having offering Avion or mobile solutions, you know, we are actually um, we're launching a mobile application. Um, I think it's either April or May, but probably May. Our selling conference season really begins in May, um, and so we're going to launch that. We kind of, we've already announced it, uh, that it's coming, but we're going to have the mobile application ready in May. Um, kind of a phase one. Of Gosh, angry birds. Very <laughs> similar. <laughs> <laughs> angry accountants. Yeah. Yeah. Are you doing IVR with the 26 people you have in-house already, or do you outsource it now? No, it, everything, let's see, really we've tried to do everything we can internal for the business. And we, we've made that decision, not that it's necessarily the best financial decision in all, all times. Um, I think outsourcing that doing, doing some creative things can be very good for small businesses. It really has more to do with our customer set and the security questionnaires that we go through. And, and our due diligence, all the top 10 banks, all the top 10 accounting firms do annual reinspections on us. They all did uh, initial inspections. The due diligence process was in between two and three years for each of those top 10 customers. And so one of the questions is, do you outsource any part of your service? It was just a lot easier for us to say no versus having to fill out the rest of those. And at the end of the day, you had to do everything on them that you would have done on an employee. So it just made sense to keep those folks closer to home without trying to, to force a different company to abide by our security standards, which are crazy. Are you spreading that service around in-house, or do you have a dedicated team? Which part just of the service? Just for Just for your customer service. Um, customer service, it's, it's our own folks. So Jeanette Hauser, who was with us from the beginning, has worn a lot of different hats. She's now the director of customer service, and we've got a team that we built under her uh, to do all that. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of ways to be creative. Uh, we've been creative where we can, uh, or early on in terms of some of those things. Uh, but there's a lot of, a lot of good ways that, that I've seen companies uh, try and conserve their cash flow. Sure. Uh, we, we did that as well. Good. Last question. You have 130 shareholders. Uh oh, who's this guy? <laughs> and, uh, and 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 some of them, I'm sure, would love liquidity in that. Are you concerned at all about the movement among a, a lot of companies to, uh, or specifically a lot of shareholders inside of companies to turn to to secondary markets, like second markets for liquidity? Mm -hmm. Interesting. And do you think that that's going to change at all the way that you deal with? the way that you deal with, with future cash? Yeah, it's a good question. What, and I can't say I anticipated the secondary markets 
um, for private company stock when we put this in the shareholder agreement. But the shareholder agreement says that if anybody looks to sell their stock, once they have a bona fide offer from somebody, then every other shareholder gets the right of first refusal to buy their pro rata share. Um, and then the company itself, if the shareholders don't do it or if the company wants to do it itself, the company can buy those shares or then the remaining shares. So there's kind of, the shareholders get an option, the company gets an option, and then if there's that person that wants to buy the rest of them, if, if any are available, um, then that would happen. And so what, the reason I put that in there was because I didn't want somebody to sell stock to somebody who either could be a potential competitor or a potential customer in order to get a look at the financial statements or margins or any other strategic things that we were doing. Um, so again, can't say that I did it with, with the secondary market in mind, but it, it certainly keeps it from that. And do you think it will affect any future capital formation? For, for our business? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Uh, it hasn't. Um, I mean, we could certainly see uh, if, you know, as we get there, if there's somebody that feels like that's a, a necessary uh, thing to, to look at in terms of raising capital for them. Um, I can't imagine necessarily that it would be, uh, but to date we haven't run into any issues with that. So, so guys, let's uh, let's thank Brian for coming. To be here.